Welcome to the Seaman Podcast and today I'm going to play you a comprehensive presentation about how to build muscle. It tells you how to train, eat and recover for muscle hypertrophy and strength. This information comes from my new book with Dr. James Dinicole Antonio and Conor McGregor's nutritionist Tristan Kennedy. You can now get our new book Win on Amazon. It includes 12 chapters about optimizing athletic performance and fitness. All right, welcome back. This is another video. We're going to talk about uh, muscle growth and uh, how do you build muscle, the mechanisms of how it happens and what are like, you know, the best ways of uh, building muscle. So yeah, I'm just going to start off with uh, my own, let's say, transformation, mini transformation that I've gone through over the years. So on the left, you can see just uh, me in uh, 2014 uh, when I was in the military and uh, I approximately weighed 69 kilograms or something like that. I was like lean. I was, uh, you know, still relatively muscular, so to say, like more muscular than the average person, but uh, definitely like, you know, smaller and uh, a bit thinner, so to say. And on the right, that's, you know, me approximately now, 2021, and now I weigh around 85 kilograms. And uh, that's sort of like, a, you know, uh, a 16 kilogram difference. And yeah, yeah now, now I have more mass, muscle mass, my, you know, all the muscles are more defined, the shoulders, the delts, etc. I am actually, you know, even maybe like a little bit, uh, I wouldn't say like, like I'm a lower body fat percentage, but I'm definitely like around the same body fat percentage. But I just look more jacked and uh, more uh, muscular because of having more muscle mass and the uh, definition is uh, more there, so to say. So uh, just the, like a difference between the military training and uh, the, uh, the, the tra training that I'm doing right now. So uh, like goes to show that, you know, um, there are like your body adapts always to what you're doing. So in the military, you're doing a lot of cardio, not a lot of like heavy weights and mostly like calisthenics, etc. which doesn't mean like you can build muscle for sure you can. Like I did build muscle in the military, but you know, there's a different ways of achieving that, which we'll, you know, discuss uh, in this video in more detail. So uh, basically the process of building muscle is called uh, hypertrophy. And, uh, you know, there's different uh, methods or dif different types of hypertrophy, but the ma ma main idea is that when you are uh, putting your body under some sort of a stress, physio mecha me mechanical stress, mechanical stimuli, then your body responds to uh, by uh, building this uh, muscle mass. And uh, hypertrophy describes like, you know, expansion of the uh, already existing uh, muscle. And uh, there's a difference between hypertrophy and hyperplasia. So hyper hypertrophy is actually the increasing of the muscle cells. The muscle cells just become more inflated and uh, they be get bigger. Whereas this is a normal muscle cell, uh, hypertrophy, uh, a muscle cell experiencing hypertrophy is going to be bigger than the normal muscle cell. And hyperplasia is actually the, the basically the replication of the muscle cells or the increase in the number size or the number of uh, total uh, muscle cells, uh, which doesn't necessarily equate to uh, having uh, bigger muscle cells, so to say. So uh, usually uh, most of the uh, process of building muscle, you know, there's a, a bit of both that's happening um, but uh, most of the process of uh, like, you know, looking, looking like a bodybuilder or looking bigger is uh, related to uh, hypertrophy. Muscle uh, cells or muscle fibers themselves are also uh, different or like the, uh, they respond differently to different kinds of training. And there's different types of hypertrophy, like I mentioned. So uh, there is a sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, which um, relate, is uh, associated with the increase in the sarcoplasmic fluid of the muscle, like all the all the like glycogen content, the creatine, um, other kinds of things that uh, make the make the muscle cell look more bigger, essentially. And there's the myofibrillar hypertrophy, which uh, relates to uh, increasing in the number of these myofibrils, which are basically muscle like fiber types. And the sarcoplasm is all this uh, fluid, the water, the glycogen uh, in between uh, the muscles. Most of most of like the training adaptations, uh, let's say strength-based adaptations, uh, are related to myofibrillar hypertrophy, like uh, powerlifting, lifting heavier weights, uh, weightlifting, those kinds of things that uh, promote myofibrillar hypertrophy. And uh, yeah, like you get stronger and you uh, experience this type of hypertrophy. Whereas if you're doing uh, more like a bodybuilding type of approach, where you're using lighter loads, but you're doing like more volume, then uh, that's associated with uh, sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. So like uh, the pump and uh, a ton of reps, a ton of sets, whereas the myofibrillar is like lower uh, reps, but heavier loads, heavier intensities, and thus um, more strength gains as well. So this is like a Olympic gymnast and powerlifter, and this is like a, like a bodybuilder. Muscle fibers are also uh, different. So uh, there's three types of uh, main muscle fibers. Type one is called the slow twitch muscle fibers. And this is associated with like endurance. 
they have uh, basically a relatively low uh, force output. They're not like explosive, they're not strong, uh, but at the same time they have like high tolerance to fatigue. They're very hard to fatigue because they're like endurance um, fibers and you can use them for like hours and hours, like walking, uh, jogging, cycling, uh, hiking, those things are used primarily type 1 uh, muscle fibers. And they have a lot of these uh, mitochondria in them, which gives them like more of this uh, red type of look. And they can like basically utilize a lot of oxygen because of that, because of the high mitochondria. The uh, type 2A uh, muscle fibers are called uh, fast twitch oxidative uh, muscle fibers. And um, they're uh, more explosive for sure than uh, the salt twitch muscle fibers. They have a medium force output, medium fatigue and medium amount of uh, mitochondria. And that they're mostly related to like this sarcoplasmic effect. Like uh, you're not fully reaching maximum intensity, but you do uh, experience uh, relatively higher uh, loads, higher mechanical tension uh, than compared to like endurance sports. So this is again like a bodybuilder type of uh, muscle fiber. And uh, lastly is the type 2B uh, fast twitch glycolytic uh, muscle fibers. Uh, they're also sarcoplasmic, but they're also mostly like the myofibrillar uh, type that they're a very high force uh, maximum near maximum effort and uh, high fatigue as well you can't use them for too long because you will get exhausted like uh, sprinting like if you were to put it on a spectrum this is you know long endurance marathon running the type 2a is um, like uh, like a 400 meter dash or something and the type 2b is the uh, 60 60 meter uh, sprint or the 100 meter sprint you can't really do it any more any longer than you know 30 or 20 seconds and they also have a lower amount of mitochondria because of that. The mitochondria are mostly related to a lot of oxygen consumption, a lot of energy production, and thus also like endurance and aerobic sports. Whereas the fast switch ones are like explosive and power, power related. Like a clean and jerk snatch powerlifting again is type 2B. And uh, you know, your body, like I said, responds to these uh, different tra training stimulus uh, differently. Uh, and uh, the sprinter has a lot of this uh, myofibrillar hypertrophy, a bit of sarcoplasmic as well, and uh, this type 2B uh, fast twitch uh, muscle fibers, whereas the marathon runner has the uh, slow twitch uh, muscle fibers, and uh, thus they don't experience that much size as well, because they're um, you know uh, doing a different kind of uh, training stimulus. What is uh, then uh, promoting muscle hypertrophy and uh, muscle growth? Uh, well, there are many contributing factors to that, but the main, let's say, key switch that I think a lot of people have heard about already is uh, the mTOR complex. And uh, mTOR is basically like this uh, fuel sensor in the body that detects different kinds of stimuli coming from the environment. And based upon that, it's going to promote cell growth, cell survival and uh, muscle growth. So there's actually uh, two uh, main complexes of mTOR, mTOR C1 complex 1 and mTOR C2 uh, complex 2. So mTOR C1 is mostly related to this uh, hypertrophy and muscle growth, cell growth, cell survival. And um, the mTOR C2 is mostly, it also, also promotes cell survival, but it doesn't have like this hypertrophy, hypertrophy effect. It's mostly actually promoting uh, cytoskeleton remodeling and uh, like the actin skeleton like bone density and the uh, collagen tissue and uh, the joints and that sort of thing. What uh, promotes mTOR? Well, there is a bunch of things and uh, the most of it has to do with actually like energy, excess energy, excess uh, nutrients. So glucose, carbohydrates, ATP, uh, energy, amino acids, uh, protein, uh, oxygen. Uh, they are like uh, needed for mTOR C1 activation and as well as a mechanical stimuli, which is, you know, training, the uh, training overload, weights, sprinting, whatever it may be, uh, calisthenics, all those things, uh, they stimulate both of the uh, complexes. And there are also like uh, growth factors like insulin, like an IGF-1 as well, which is another growth factor. Uh, growth hormone um, doesn't necessarily promote uh, mTOR C1, but it does promote uh, IGF-1, which then uh, does promote mTOR C1. So uh, yeah, the growth factor is basically uh, the body detects growth and uh, then turns on mTOR which then uh, sends the signal to the body that okay it's okay to build muscle you don't need to be catabolic like autophagy when mTOR C1 is activated then autophagy gets blocked because autophagy is a process of uh, not growing but actually degrading autophagy is degrading all these different kinds of uh, you know cell material and uh, autophagy and mTOR, they can't coexist at the same time. From a, like evolutionary perspective, your body would want to build muscle or uh, break down at separate times. It can't do it at the same time because it's, you know, energy, e energy um, intensive a process. 
testosterone. So uh, a lot of people know that testosterone is like the male hormone, although like women have it as well. And testosterone has a pretty direct effect on uh, muscle hypertrophy. So even uh, like injecting uh, like the, the artificial uh, testosterone to uh, people, it does have like this uh, benefit benefit on uh, muscle growth and muscle hypertrophy. And the way testosterone uh, works is that um, testosterone binds to basically like you have circulating testosterone and testosterone binds to the cells androgen receptors so your different muscles have muscle cells have androgen receptors and they uh, detect androgens and testosterone testosterone binds to them then it's going to basically uh, activate satellite cell activation uh, myonucleus and uh, that leads to muscle hypertrophy like um, through the satellite cells it uh, promotes myonuclear growth and formation of these myotubes which basically, you know, just builds builds this uh, muscle framework, framework and muscle tissue. Um, yeah. How do you build muscle? Well, uh, the main <laughs> main uh, let's say uh, core idea of uh, muscle hypertrophy over time is uh, progressive overload. And progressive overload just means that your body is experiencing this increasing amount of stress, mechanical stimuli, mechanical tension that over time leads to muscle growth. So if you're uh, a beginner, then you know obviously you can't lift heavy weights um, because you don't have the strength. Your body hasn't adapted to it, both uh, both the hypertrophy-wise as well as the uh, central nervous system-wise. So you need to start off with the weights that you're currently at, like lighter weights and uh, your body is still struggling a bit and uh, as you get stronger over time you increase the weights and uh, your body is almost like in a, almost in a linear fashion you get bigger based upon uh, how much weights can you lift so if you can't lift heavy weights then you can't be big either because the uh, the the tension isn't there the, the adaptation isn't there whereas if you are increasing the weights over time you get stronger your uh, nervous system also gets stronger then the body just responds to that uh, by becoming bigger, essentially. The mechanisms of muscle, muscle hypertrophy, there are three of them, the three main ones, mechanic, metabolic stress, uh, muscle damage, and mechanical tension. And uh, mechanical tension, the progressive overload, is actually the vast majority of what contributes to uh, muscle hypertrophy. So uh, almost like, I would, I would say that maybe like 70% is going to come from mechanical tension. So 70% of your muscle growth is, is determined by progressive overload. How strong are you going to be able to get? And, you know, progressive overload doesn't necessarily always mean uh, adding heavier weights. It can also mean uh, doing more reps. Just means that you get stronger over time. You can't stay the same or you won't build, you won't build any muscle if you stay the same all the time. You have to uh, get stronger in some shape or form. And uh, you can also get stronger by improving the quality of your repetitions, like slowing down the repetitions doing paused reps and connecting to the muscle a bit better because you know there's a lot of mind muscle connection that also um, is in uh, weightlifting and uh, doing resistance training so uh, like doing uh, let's say sloppy repetitions you may get the weight off but you're not really fully recruiting all the muscle fibers you're not really fully recruiting all the type 2b uh, muscle fibers to see this uh, proper adaptation so you need to be uh, like there is like a very subjective difference between um, it's, it's very subjective. Progressive overload is very subjective. What I mean is that, you know, you have to uh, do, uh, you have to subjectively feel that it's difficult and uh, the mechanical tension is going to determine that. And uh, metabolic stress refers to basically like the pump, the uh, feeling of burn, <laughs> the feeling of uh, lactic acid uh, accumulating in your muscle tissue. And that is also like a signal to the body that, okay, there's this like Toxins, uh, the lactate is considered like a waste material and uh, this uh, accumulation of this waste material It means that you know, we need to kind of get stronger. So we experience this stress and uh, We have to adapt and usually the metabolic stress is achieved with a, like a higher repetition scheme So uh, instead of doing like near maximum uh, lifts you do like a higher rep type of thing and uh, Lastly is the muscle damage which is basically when you are lifting something uh, doing resistance training then you are damaging the muscle fibers and uh, as they get repaired you know they get uh, stronger and the most most any kind of you know exercise may cause muscle damage but most of it or the 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 type of exercise that causes the most muscle damage is the eccentric uh, exercises like the negative part of the repetition so uh, the very slow contractions of you know trying to resist it and trying to slow down the rep as much as possible that is causing actually the most amount of muscle damage and uh, muscle damage can also be experienced with uh, like increased range of motion so if you're doing, uh, let's say, quarter squats, you're not going full depth, 
then uh, yeah, you may build muscle, but you're only building muscle in those um, in those muscle fibers that are being uh, stimulated and recruited. Whereas if you go full depth, you know, ask the grass, then uh, then uh, the uh, amount of muscle fibers recruited is also greater. You are going, you're recruiting more muscle fibers, and uh, that generally is in research is also associated with uh, greater gains in muscle and strength if you go a full range of motion. So in most cases, I would recommend to always train in the fullest range of motion that you can. Uh, within reason, of course, but um, because it, it's going to give you the most results and it's also the safest. Because imagine if you are training always, like, say, uh, quarter, squats, quarter squats and you're not going below parallel or you're not going full depth, then whenever you accidentally do go below parallel, then you're not, your body isn't uh, ready for, for, for it to deal with that weight. So to say, your uh, below parallel muscles aren't ready to deal with the heavy weight and then you may get injured or, you know, you fall under the weight or something. So it's always better to uh, train in the fullest range of motion as you can for safety as well as the, um, the actual benefits and the gains. And lastly, the novelty is also something that causes a muscle damage. If you're doing some sort of a new exercise, you know, I, I would imagine that if you have, haven't gone to the gym, then you go there then the next day you're going to be super sore because you haven't tried trained it uh, in a long time and it's a cause of novelty and uh, because the higher amount of muscle damage whereas if you are training um, that same type of workout all the time then your body kind of gets used to it and it's going to experience less damage so adding some novelty every once in a while changing your program uh, doing different kinds of exercises different kinds of rep schemes it has a positive effect uh, on um, hypertrophy at least like in uh, moderation <laughs> because you don't want to be doing too much novelty either too much novelty means that you're doing like cardio with weights every time you're doing these crazy random exercises and you're never giving your body uh, enough time to adapt so um, we'll talk about you know how long you should do uh, certain exercises but yeah you know the novelty is um, something that you can play around with and like i said most of the results is going to come from a mechanical tension getting stronger over time and um, you know adding adding this uh, weight so what is the process look like basically you have mechanical stimulus or mechanical tension from training then uh, there's these anabolic hormones testosterone IGF-1 and the uh, like amino acids you need to be lost almost also in an anabolic state to build muscle like uh, if you're fasting or if you're in a calorie deficit then it's much harder to build muscle so you need to have the anabolic pathways uh, activated and some nutrients present mostly amino acids that uh, promote um, mTOR activation and uh, muscle growth. So whenever it does happen, then uh, satellite, cells, satellite cells get activated, mTOR gets activated, and this leads to muscle protein synthesis, which describes the creation of new uh, muscle protein, basically. And as a result, you get uh, new, new muscle and uh, muscle hypertrophy and strength. Things that inhibit this process are, you know, aging in general, you, when you get older, these uh, hormones get more desensitized and you become more resistant against them. Atrophy itself, you know, uh, cancer, cachexia, malnutrition, uh, those sorts of things, and bed rest. Like if you're uh, completely sedentary or if you're out in space, then uh, you would see uh, this det deterioration of your muscle tissue and uh, lack of, because there's no stimulus there. There's no stimulus when you're in uh, bed rest and uh, in space. There's also things that, uh, like uh, hormonal factors that can uh, inhibit muscle growth. Myostatin, is basically like this uh, protein or a gene, much rather uh, like a gene in the body that inhibits muscle growth. So because like from an evolutionary perspective, survival perspective, your body doesn't want to have like a ton of muscle. Like it wants maybe like a little bit, but it's always uh, trying to uh, reduce it because muscle burns a lot of calories. It's a uh, like energy consuming uh, tissue, uh, much more so than fat. And uh, so your body always tries to, let's say, put the brakes on the muscle. And when myostatin is activated, then um, your muscle tissue is not growing or it's uh, slowed down to a great extent. Thing, there are ways to also inhibit myostatin, like uh, resistance training itself. Training uh, inhibits myostatin, so it takes the brakes off, so to say, because your body thinks that, okay, there is a reason why we need the muscle, because there's the mechanical stimuli. And the myostatin then takes like, the back burner. And there's also things like creatine, that uh, inhibits myostatin as well. And I would imagine like um, like a high quality diet that incorporates a lot of amino acids and uh, other types of proteins uh, that can also maybe inhibit myostatin. And then there's, you know, cortisol, glucocorticoids, stress basically um, can, uh, basically stress will lower testosterone and anabolic hormones, but it also has a directly uh, catabolic effect on muscle tissue and can inhibit basically muscle protein synthesis. So what kind of exercises should you uh, do to build muscle? The research finds that uh, the compound lifts, the full body compound lifts that uh, target multiple muscle groups and multi-joints 
uh, those appear to be uh, the most effective for building muscle and they also raise the most testosterone and they raise the most IGF-1 because um, you're using multiple muscle groups and you're, you know, basically your full body is engaged and you're activating all the muscle fibers. So that's why it's generally much more effective than isolation exercises. So the, uh, the compound lifts are bench press, uh, shoulder press, squat, deadlift, barbell row, pull-ups, dips, and uh, all, all those different kinds of exercises, whereas isolation exercises are uh, biceps curl, uh, triceps push down, cable flies, and those things. You can definitely add them into your workout routine, but the main uh, focus should always be on the compound lifts. The main compound lifts and uh, getting stronger in those, increasing the weight on those lifts. And like the, most of the three main muscle groups are like push, push uh, muscle groups, bench press, um, incline press, uh, shoulder press, etc., triceps. And pull muscles, pull ups, rows, lat pull downs, those sort of things, and legs, squats, uh, front squats, deadlifts, Romanian deadlifts, those things. So these are the three main muscle groups. Different kinds of workout routines are out there. Some do the push pull leg split, that on one day you train push, the next day pull, the next day uh, legs, or some other training routines also do full body exercises that you uh, to train all. All, all three muscle groups in one um, in one session, but with that you have to be more careful with how many exercises are you doing. So if you're doing a full body exercise routine, then you can't do like you know 15 exercises because you're gonna be just get over fried, and then you have to actually just focus on the main combat lifts. The three main variables of training that you can manipulate are uh, frequency, which is you know how often you train, intensity, the uh, how near maximum effort it is, how hard it is, how heavy it is, and uh, volume, basically how much of it are you doing, how many repetitions, how many sets, and how many training sessions per week are you doing. So these three are the main ones. You can't really do all at once, so to say. You can't do high frequency, high intensity, high volume, because you're going to get uh, overtraining, and you're going to get fried. You're not going to make any progress. So... Uh, Good training programs usually prioritize only two of them at once, so it's in a triangle. So you can do high frequency and high intensity, but then you can't do high volume. So let's say you train every day and you do a high intensity, you uh, reach your near maximum effort, but you're keeping the reps very low. So you're doing only three reps, maybe two reps, and the sets also relatively low, like three sets, five sets at max. Whereas if you're doing, uh, let's say, high frequency and high volume, you train every day and you do like... 20 repetitions, 5 sets, then you have to keep the intensity also lower because um, you wouldn't be able to handle that amount of volume at that intensity. So the, in this scenario, the intensity has to be probably like 50 to 60%. Like a, This would be like an example of a farmer or like a construction worker. High frequency and high volume, but lower intensity. So you're not li really lifting near maximum weights. Whereas this is more of like this professional sports athlete type of approach. You train very frequently and at uh, near maximum efforts, but you keep the volume uh, relatively low. And of course, you, you could do the uh, Goldilocks zone or the balanced approach that you do relatively moderate frequency, relatively moderate volume and relatively moderate intensity. But then I would imagine that it wouldn't be enough to see like uh, progress over the long term because you lack the intensity. So you do need to be tapping into this uh, high intensity zone every once in a while uh, to see like progress because he, like I said, Progressive overload requires this uh, mechanical tension to be there and you need to add the mechanical tension over time Because if you keep lifting the same weights all the time, then it's not gonna work after a while It's, it's gonna stop working because your body has gotten strong enough So um, here's uh, actually like a graph of the uh, different kinds of reps and uh, set schemes and the percentages of them so let's take warm-up so warm-up sets are something that should be you know much lower in the intensity usually preferably like 50 to 55 percent and the reps are thus a bit higher uh, you don't need to do a ton of warm-up sets but it is generally a good idea to when you start to work out to do at least like one to two and three uh, warm-up sets at like this very uh, small smaller intensity the hypertrophy effect is uh, generally achieved with about, about like 8 to 12 repetitions and the intensity has to be 60 to 70 percent of your uh, one repetition maximum and uh, when it comes to uh, this hypertrophy scheme then the amount of sets is usually three to five uh, in total to see uh, like an adaptation response then you need to be doing approximately like 24 or 30 uh, working uh, repetitions 
uh, so working meaning uh, at the maximum weight that you're training. So uh, 30 repetitions, and if you're doing 8 to 12 repetitions, then that would entail 3 sets. So you don't need to be doing 50 repetitions. <laughs> you only need to stimulate it about like uh, 30 repetitions. And But if you're doing you know strength-based movements, and your repetitions are around 5 to 6, around there, then you would need to do a bit more uh, sets, like five sets would be ideal for this uh, five repetition scheme. And the strength training intensity is uh, 75 to 80% 80, 80 of the intensity. And lastly, there's the power, which uh, is in here, it says two to four, but uh, in my opinion, power would be anything like one to two <laughs> repetitions, because the power is the idea behind power training would be to, yeah, just max out, uh, do the repetition as heavy as possible and as fast as possible. So power examples would be sprinting, uh, as well as like clean and jerk, snatch, uh, max max barbell squat and those things. Uh, power athletes usually do train in this uh, very low repetition schemes, but the average person, um, they uh, may want to do a bit more of this strength-based and more of this hypertrophy uh, style training because they're going to see uh, more uh, results in terms of muscle gain because the power, like uh, you re like you remember, the power training trains mostly um, the myofibrillar hypertrophy, the um, very tight, or very, um, very uh, yeah, like the amount of muscle myofibrils that getting increased without the increase in muscle size. And lastly, this training is basically yeah, like training the actual one repetition maximum, which, uh, you know, can be related to some sort of sports performance, like gymnasts, when they train this maximum effort, then they are trying to uh, basically reach the 100% of their uh, maximum. Training frequency, how much should you train? Uh, well, um, research finds that the generally like a slightly higher uh, training frequency is better for muscle hypertrophy or muscle growth, because uh, if you compare training a muscle group four times a week versus training it twice a week, then training it four times a week would uh, keep the muscle protein synthesis elevated for much longer or more frequently, so to say. If you train twice a week, you train on one day, the protein synthesis in that muscle is going to stay elevated for maybe 24 to 48 hours, depends on your training status. If you're a beginner, then the muscle signal can stay elevated for up to a week, but uh, after a while, you get uh, resistant to that and it only stays elevated for 24 to 48 hours. So if you train only on Monday, then by Wednesday, that, got, it, that muscle signal is gone. So you need to be training again to kick it up. And uh, thus, if you were to train a muscle group once a week and you're already adapted to it, then uh, you're missing out on a lot of uh, gains. Because if you try to train four times a week, you know, every other day, uh, let's say like a full body workout, then you would keep the muscle protein synthesis elevated basically all the, all the time. Like whenever you're eating, then you're promoting muscle growth because the... Uh, the muscles are already primed to be building muscle from the training stimulus. Uh, for most people, I, I don't. See, at minimum, I recommend training a muscle group twice a week, and at maximum four times a week. Because uh, yeah, like overtraining is still something that would inhibit this process. Uh, I personally train um, three times a week with weights. Um, maybe like a fourth workout would be like calisthenics, but yeah, three times a week, something like that. So how does the progressive overload look over time? So uh, when, you're, when you're, we are doing weights or resistance training, then uh, this initial encounter with the weights will cause some stress and damage to the body. You get weaker in the short term and you, over time you would uh, get stronger if you have like sufficient amount of sleep, nutrition, amino acids, rest, and also things like saunas can uh, promote the recovery and you would get back into a higher level of performance. You would get stronger, you would build muscle and that's the way it goes. It keeps on, uh, you get weaker, but you get stronger. You get weaker, but you get stronger. Uh, the problem is that if you get weaker and you uh, aren't taking care of the fundamentals, you're not sleeping enough, you're not eating enough, you're experiencing a lot of stress, then you could get you know, weaker as well. You could uh, um, degrade, you could deteriorate. And uh, you, can come back, you can come back from those uh, things, but it just requires a bit more effort. So uh, yeah, over time, you just need to... Uh, Take care of the fundamentals and uh, repeatedly put yourself under higher uh, per, higher amounts of mechanical tension and higher amounts of like metabolic stress and uh, that sort of thing. And over time, you would see your performance increase. That's how you get stronger. That's how you build muscle. And that's how you also um, increase power and uh, those things. All right, mTOR. What turns on mTOR besides uh, resistance training? So amino acids, like I said, leucine is the most, let's say, uh, anabolic uh, amino acid that is responsible for mTOR the most. Uh, 
and uh, in uh, research the leucine threshold for activating mTOR is around like 2 grams after 3 grams uh, younger people need less leucine to turn on mTOR and muscle protein synthesis, whereas older people need a bit more because they're more, let's say, their hormonal, hormonal system has become older and they are uh, less sensitive to that. And uh, yeah, you can get 2 to 3 grams of leucine from about like 20 to 30 grams of protein. And uh, yeah, the a eating anything less wouldn't be like optimal, in my opinion. Like if you're, if you're eating less than 20 grams of protein per meal, then uh, you're missing out on a lot and you're not really doing any favors for uh, muscle growth. So at a minimum, your meals should include, you know, 30 grams, in my opinion, at least. And upward, the upward to 50 grams or, you know, you can even eat 100 grams per meal, but 30 grams at least is the minimum. And there's also insulin and IGF-1 uh, that also uh, activate mTOR through another pathway in the cell. And uh, yeah, insulin from carbohydrates can do that. IGF-1 from growth hormone IGF-1 from protein as well, and IGF-1 from carbohydrates, again, uh, leads to that. And the end product is uh, muscle protein synthesis. How much protein should you eat? So, uh, the research is uh, pretty clear on that, actually. Like, we already know how much is the optimal amount. Uh, so, uh, when you... when Like, the RDA is about, like, 0 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. And uh, whenever you start increasing that upward to 1.6, then uh, you will see uh, increase in uh, muscle tissue as a result of that. And it caps out at 1.6 to 2.4 grams per kilogram. Uh, so for, let's say, me who weighs uh, 86 kilograms, then for me, that's, uh, you know, I try to get it at least like 2 grams per kilogram. So for me, it's at least like 170 grams, 175 grams of protein a day. If I go above that, you know, that's fine, but I'm not expecting any additional muscle growth uh, from that because, yeah, the research is pretty clear that you don't see any additional muscle growth beyond the 1.6 to 2.4 gram per kilogram uh, mark. Uh, but if uh, there are studies where uh, the people consume more, like 2.4 to 3.3 grams per kilogram of protein, which is like for me would be uh, 200, 220 grams of protein, then... Uh, they see uh, that the muscle mass is still the same. They don't build more muscle, but they see a bit less uh, fat mass uh, from that because uh, protein is very thermogenic. You consume protein and your body uh, expands a lot of energy to digest that protein and you lose basically calories. So eating more protein is not going to build more muscle, but it does help with, uh, let's say, uh, calorie burn. You burn more calories for that. And uh, if you're in an energy deficit, you're trying to cut weight or you're trying to maximize satiety, then uh, a higher protein uh, can be still even better for that. How frequently should you eat? So uh, there is also like a th th threshold uh, for how much protein stimulates uh, muscle protein synthesis. And uh, that threshold in research appears to be around 30 to 40 grams of protein per meal. Uh, so uh, if, you, um, if you were to eat more than that, then your body wouldn't like lose it. Uh, it's not going to waste it. It's, it's going to absorb it over time, but you're not activating more uh, muscle protein synthesis. And for that... To overcome this limitation, then you would need to be eating very frequently, like four to six times a day, to see an additional muscle building benefit. Uh, the uh, research finds that the maximum uh, frequency for uh, muscle protein synthesis and muscle growth would be four meals a day, and they're separated by like four hours. Like the bodybuilders are notorious for eating six times a day, eight times a day, or ten times a day, even sometimes. Um, for them, it may be worthwhile because they're also like taking anabolic steroids, but the average person doesn't they're not going to see any additional muscle building benefits from four meals a day. Uh, which doesn't mean that eating less frequently would have like a negative impact on muscle growth. It's just that um, you're uh, stimulating the muscle protein synthesis less often and uh, your speed of muscle building would also be a bit slower. Uh, but, you know, over time, you could see like the still uh, same benefits. If, as long as you're hitting your daily protein intake off around this uh, area, then it doesn't really matter uh, how frequently you're going to eat. Like I, you know, eat mostly... Uh, uh, one meal a day, but I also incorporate this uh, protein shake into my workouts that basically gives me uh, two uh, protein spikes, uh, two muscle building protein spikes per day. Uh, so one meal a day would be like pretty hard to build muscle with, but the two meals is uh, perfectly fine for most people. And three meals is also fine, like breakfast, lunch and dinner. It's also very fine. But if you were to be very serious, like you're actually doing natural bodybuilding and you want to really fully maximize uh, muscle growth or you're an athlete, then a four meal would be the maximum recommended uh, amount. 
And like I said, the amount of protein uh, that you ingest gets capped off, or how much protein synthesis gets uh, stimulated gets capped off, and uh, 20 grams already is, suffice, is sufficient, and uh, for, there's no additional benefit uh, beyond 40 grams. If you eat more than that, then yeah, your body just uh, slows down the absorption of protein, and it's going to absorb it later, but it's not going to have an additional uh, mTOR activation effect or protein synthesis. What kinds of protein to eat? You know, uh, protein is in a lot of different foods. Uh, most of the highest proteins are uh, meat, eggs, fish, uh, cottage cheese, dairy, uh, chicken, those sort of things. Those are the highest protein foods. Uh, but there's also like protein in nuts, uh, beans, seeds, uh, legumes, even like vegetables, etc. But the difference between plant-based and uh, animal-based protein is that uh, plant-based is much lower in protein and uh, they don't also have like all the amino acids. They generally don't have that much uh, leucine to uh, reach the leucine threshold. Whereas you can reach it very easily with animal protein. Like you can eat three eggs and you've already hit the maximum leucine threshold. Uh, or like even like six ounces of meat, you're already going to maximize the leucine threshold. So the research finds that you can still uh, build muscle with only plant-based proteins. You just have to be eating a bit more to compensate for the lack of amino acids. So if you were to be, let's say, um, the average person could eat 1.6 grams of protein per day to maximize uh, muscle growth, then if you're eating only plant-based protein, then you would need maybe like 2.0 uh, or 2.4 to reach that same effect. So you just need to be eating more uh, protein, um, you know, which uh, just like a difference. So like a, if you were head to head compared, the animal protein is just uh, more anabolic and more protein uh, or more amino acids. Like I said, leucine is the main uh, amino acid, but there are also like different kinds of uh, essential amino acids, um, methionine, valine, etc. So um, yeah, the animal-based proteins are all higher in the uh, EAAs and leucine as well. So we have whey, milk, casein, beef, egg, fish, etc. And then there's also all these uh, plant-based uh, foods. So yeah, you can certainly, like in the modern world, there's no, at least like in Western society, there's no like real malnutrition uh, danger as long as you're eating a good diet. And uh, yeah, you can still reach the uh, desired effect, just gonna take more time, maybe more effort, and uh, yeah, you just have to consume a bit more protein. Or if you're taking like a plant-based sourced uh, protein powder, like a soy protein powder, or a hemp protein powder, rice protein powder, then you probably would overcome that effect because the protein powders themselves are very concentrated forms of this uh, protein, and they also have uh, added amino acids in them that uh, would maximize the leucine threshold immediately. So that's why the whey protein is uh, considered to be uh, the most anabolic, let's say, food. Because it's animal-based, it has all the amino acids, it's high in leucine, and it's uh, also more bioavailable. Like the, That's another difference, that the animal protein is just uh, more easily absorbable and more bioavailable. So you lose a bit more protein uh, on the digestion if you're getting it from uh, plant-based plant -based sources. So what are different kinds of diets out there? Like I, I've made a video about uh, ranking the best diets for muscle growth. And uh, in my opinion, there's like the best one out there is the vertical diet, which is basically rice and uh, beef, <laughs> rice and red meat, plus some uh, other uh, vegetables and uh, nutrients. That is very good because it's high in protein, high in amino acids, as well as high in carbs. So the carbs are going to, car carbs are needed for muscle growth, but they do have uh, like a good effect on uh, glycogen resynthesis and exercise performance so you can lift heavier weights and chances are yeah you're gonna build a bit more muscle if you're eating carbs plus protein instead of just protein uh, another one is just a standard uh, bodybuilding diet chicken breasts and broccoli and rice that's similar to the vertical diet not much difference but the uh, chicken is a bit uh, less nutritious than beef for example of course you can also do the if it fits your macros approach that uh you're hitting uh, the uh, optimal amount of protein and the rest of the calories come from like whatever you want, like uh, junk food or something. Uh, that can also f certainly work. It is, you know, still pretty effective because as long as you're hitting your protein, then it doesn't really matter where the rest of the calories coming from. Uh, are they carbs or fats? But at the same time, the carbs are sh superior for sure uh, when it comes to muscle building and hypertrophy. And then there's the lean gains diet, which is uh, intermittent fasting, 16 any type of intermittent fasting, and like an infinite feature macros approach. So even two meals a day can be uh, pretty effective still uh, for muscle growth. Uh, other categories are carb backloading, which is just eating carbs at night, which is just fine uh, as long as you're getting enough protein. And the zone diet, you're eating 30% uh, protein, 30% fat and 40% carbs. That's also fine. The paleo diet, eating uh, 
like caveman foods, meats, vegetables, and those things, also fine, high in protein. Uh, the carnivore diet, high in protein, is gonna be fine. Um, but yeah, you, if you were to add, let's say, more rice or like fruit, it will be more like the vertical diet, and uh, it would be, I think, superior for that. And uh, the gallon of milk a day diet, so uh, drinking a gallon of milk, so milk is very high in protein, not high, but high in uh, IG-1 and high in leucine, and it does have anabolic effects, but it's also high in calories. So if you were to be drinking only a gallon of milk a day and other foods, then uh, you would gain a lot of mass, but it can also be like a body fat. So you don't really, uh, unless you're like a very skinny guy, then you don't really need to be doing uh, that. Some, some diets that are like slower in process are vegetarian diet because it's, um, you know, uh, tends to be slightly lower in protein and, you know, if you eat only eggs and fish, you can still hit higher protein intake, uh, but um, generally like red meat also has like some other things beneficial for uh, muscle growth. Uh, the keto gains diet is uh, keto but higher in protein, so that's also pretty good and uh, most people can do fine with it, uh, but it's generally a bit slower of a process than uh, eating carbs. And uh, last row is gonna be uh, the vegan diet, Mediterranean diet, standard American diet, keto diet, and the warrior diet. So those diets are generally here because they're a bit lower in protein. With the vegan diet, you just have to um, be more careful with that and uh, make sure you hit enough protein. With the keto diet, the same. The standard keto diet is very low in protein and not really suitable for uh, maximizing muscle hypertrophy. Whereas the keto gains is a bit better for that. The warrior diet is like one meal a day. Uh, but it's because it's it is one meal a day. It's hard to build muscle with that. Uh, whereas the one that I'm doing, where I have the protein shake during the day, that generally overcomes that limitation. And lastly, in the category is the catabolic AF, which is I would put here like the fruit fruitarian diet, eating only fruit because you know it's uh, low in low in uh, protein, and uh, you would go catabolic as a, eventually. Like you may not you might experience it in. Uh, a few weeks or months even, but over years you would uh, see like the slow deterioration of the muscle tissue because of not getting enough protein. And here is a, like a brief overview of the vertical diet as well. So Stan Efferding is the creator of it. He's like a record holding power lifter. Uh, so it is basically focusing on mostly white rice because it's easy to digest. It's high in, high in carbs and it is, doesn't cause like a lot of uh, GI stress. And the meat, the protein is mostly red meat because it's loaded with all the different mi micronutrients and uh, high in protein as well. So you just uh, stack those and uh, basically the rest of it come from uh, my, or you uh, basically cover all your micronutrients first, like carrots, uh, vitamin C, uh, eggs, some fish, some vegetables, etc. but you don't really uh, do them in volume. You uh, basically hit the minimal effective dose with these foods and then you stack it or you scale it up with red meat and rice. So once you got your micronutrients covered, then the rest of the calories will come from rice and red meat. So that's kind of the vertical diet. You go upwards <laughs> into the vertical zone uh, with uh, rice and the uh, red meat. All right, well, this is it for this video. Uh, I hope you got some valuable information from that. Um, I personally, I'm doing like a cyclical uh, keto diet with carb backloading and one meal a day and intermittent fasting. Uh, my book, Metabolic Autophagy, talks about that. But it's very similar in like um, the vertical diet as well, although I don't eat a lot, ton of rice. But it's uh, similar in principle that I do eat high protein and on some days I also eat carbs. But yeah, I do also individual fasting and um, other, other types of things. Okay, so <laughs> that's it for this video. And yeah, stay tuned for the future ones.